Hello and welcome to the Engage Brain Podcast. Today's episode is sponsored by RBI Lucid Dreaming. During lucid dreaming, the dreamer may allegedly be able to exert some degree of control over the dream characters, the narrative, and the environment. It's everyone's greatest dream. Leave your boring everyday life and enter a dream world where you have full control. RBI Lucid Dreaming is a, a night mask that not only blocks out the light, but also using our understanding of R- REM, sorry, REM behavior disorder. The RBI sends stimulation to inhibit the inhibition on the nucleus gigantocellularis so that you can act out your dreams. It also sends stimulation to serotonergic centers in the brainstem to heighten your dreaming experience with the hope of unlocking control over your dreams. So dream better with RBI Lucid Dreaming. It's REM behavior in order. Uh, Your dreams, your way. Sleep is one of the most interesting and least understood processes we engage in. For something that we spend up to one-third of our lives that engaged in, it's surprising that we don't know more about it. Sleep seems to play a role in both body and mind recovery, along with countless other activities. I mean, I, can't even men- I haven't even mentioned the most interesting aspect of sleep yet. Dreams. Why do we dream? What do they mean? How can I control them? Uh, but there's a number of other interesting aspects of sleep, like why do some people talk in their sleep? Why do some people walk in their sleep? So today I sit down with Murray Clayton and talk about somnambulism or sleepwalking. Uh, So I'm here with Mary Clayton and we're talking about uh, sleepwalking other things to do with sleep maybe too yes. sleepwalking in particular though yes. all right uh, so yeah. <clears throat> i'd like to start the by asking everyone uh, what uh, got your spiked your interest in uh, your topic um i was interested in the topic uh because ever since i was little i have sleepwalked um and i will talk in my sleep and carry out conversations and just not and then I wake up and I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. And I actually, I still do it, which I thought I stopped, but nope. So that's like what really got me yeah. interested in trying to figure out what causes it. And yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of people come to college uh, and usually they'll have like had their own room for a little while uh, in the end, at the end of high school. And then all of a sudden they'd come to college and have roommates, and their roommates are like, "Oh, you do weird things in your sleep." <laughs> so kind of a, a common, uh, common finding. Uh, but uh, so kind of maybe a somewhat of a self-reflective project. Yes, uh, I, I know I'm not as bad as I was, um, a while ago, because mm-hmm. I would walk downstairs and talk to my parents. They would give me a glass of water. Or like go back to bed. I'm like, okay. And then I tell people, like, I'm not asleep. I'm awake when I'm asleep. Oh, yeah. So it's... <laughs> I guess that can be a problem. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I just was interested in it and I'm trying to learn more about it. Yeah, and so what have you found uh, in trying to learn more about it? Um, I have found that, like, um, if you don't sleep... Like, if you... Well, first, like, genetics. So if someone in your family has it Mm -hmm. you have a greater chance of experiencing it and um like young children are also um have increased an increased chance of sleepwalking um yeah 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 so i i thought i always kind of thought it was just a developmental thing where kids for whatever reason sleepwalk and sleep talk but they kind of grow out of it Uh, but that doesn't seem to be the case. Yes. Um, I forget the name of the study, but I found um, that it was talking about that no, some people, I mean, the percentage is less. Mm. Um, but some people just don't. It's not something that's you always grow out of. Yeah. So, I mean, I could be sleepwalking and talking for a while. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and 
have you found differences in people's brains uh, across sleepwalkers and, and non-sleepwalkers? I am still in the process of finding out about that. Mm-hmm. Um, hopefully I will have more information yeah, I suppose it's, it's kind of something that's not researched all that much because it's probably not that big of a problem. Yes, um, I was I was having trouble finding certain articles that because it just seems like there wasn't a ton out there. Yeah, I know there's a really small, limited uh, kind of study on sleep killing. I don't know; if that's not the like true term for it. But there was like I want to say like in the '90s, uh, a couple of cases where people murdered someone in their sleep and uh, then you know the the case came around and they're like um, oh you murdered this person and they're like oh no I didn't I was asleep and they're like oh sure good defense Uh, but they had shown that uh, these individuals were able to like fully function and like you were saying uh, tell people that they're awake and all these different things but their brains were showing that they were asleep what happened Oh, so they, uh, I, I want to say that some people were um, exonerated to a certain extent. I think they were all, uh, like, uh, given kind of, like, lower sentences. Uh, so, like, not first-degree murder, uh, but it was, like, kind of, like, I want to say, like, manslaughter. Like, basically, you have this disorder, and you haven't done anything to, like, treat yourself for it. And so because you didn't take precautions, uh, you're still culpable uh, for accidentally killing people while you're asleep okay yeah so s- some interesting uh, cases that you might come across uh, maybe there's been some more work to try to understand why those people were able to do those things I will look into that yeah because that's fascinating yeah yeah it was great it, it was kind of I want to say like along the similar lines of the other stuff that we talked about in neuroscience and law where uh, there's uh, the like false memories I think were kind of around the same time where uh, individuals were uh, like 20 years later were all of a sudden like recovering uh, memories of abuse from their childhood uh, but the researchers found that those memories were basically like being implanted by the um, poor um, therapy sessions that were being used and then uh, the police interview techniques were basically like creating people's memories around uh, certain things and then people were sleep killing <laughs> so it was an interesting time for psychology and law sounds like (laughs) interesting yeah uh and so now let me see looking at here um you created a infographic for uh the topic of sleepwalking Uh, i know you said before we started that you're anti-social media uh so did you you don't have any uh, social media that you shared it upon i have no social media okay never had a facebook or anything you're probably like the point oh oh one percent of millennials that. Yes, I mean I have a. The only thing I have is I I have the app Yik Yak. Oh okay. But um, I've never once posted. Yeah. I just read comments. Read comments. Uh, oh. I don't even post on. I don't have a. Well, I guess you have a YouTube account because if you have Gmail. If you have Gmail, yeah. But yeah, don't post any comments. Nothing. Yeah. Do you ever uh, do you lurk on Reddit? No. Okay. I mean, I'll read things yeah. on there, but nope, I don't. Nothing. Yeah. That's that's. Uh, I don't even like photos. I don't want my photo taken. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. You are, like I said in the point oh one percent of millennials. Yes. Uh, you're making. You're helping bring the average of uh, crazy people who take a thousand photos of themselves every day. Uh, back down towards normal uh, reality. I think I'm just one step removed from you. I have many social media accounts. I've only become slightly more active more recently. In particular, I, lo- I love Twitter uh, and sharing things on there, but I don't share much on Facebook and probably wouldn't have it if I wasn't married. <laughs> uh, people think you're strange if, if you are and you don't have one. Uh, but going back to uh, sleepwalking talk. So since you don't have social media, you uh, probably don't know what the public response has been to. I have no clue. Thing. I know that uh, when I looked at it, there was uh, a couple. Of, uh, I want to say in the dozens of views, so uh, okay. like twenty or so. Uh, but uh, for not pushing it out there, I'd say that's a lot, in my opinion. 
I mean, uh, yeah, because I can't really be found yeah. on the internet. Yeah. Uh, and so how about uh, going forward with uh, sleepwalking? Uh, do you think that there's any new or developing areas of research that uh, are happening going forward? I'm, I'm sure there's going to be mm -hmm. developments. Um, it's just, it's been hard trying to find things just yeah. in general on it. Um, it's, it just doesn't seem like, because it doesn't affect a ton of people. Right. So I guess... And like I said, it seems pretty benign anyways. Like I, I, like I said, I, to me, I understood it as just like a phase that kids went, some kids went through and then grew out of. And what's the big deal of someone sleepwalking? Usually not that bad, except for that tangent I went on about the sleep killing. <laughs> so I can understand that. Why would you research this? Like, yeah, some people sleepwalk. Yeah, I think that's what... Most researchers are saying. <laughs> They're like, what's the point? Yeah. Uh, do you, is there any um, kind of uh, suggestion, as a sleepwalker, any sort of suggestions you have for people interacting with sleepwalkers? I mean, I've never really interacted with a person who's sleepwalking. Okay. Um, I've interacted with someone who sleep talks. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, it's kind of funny. Yeah. But it can... Yeah, no, I don't okay. really know. I, d I just wondered, like, so I thought there'd be I, some I know debate. some people, like, they're like, oh, don't wake up yeah, a sleepwalker, thinking. but I don't really see any harm. Any harm. I mean, I would so I would rather someone wake me up. Yeah. Just because I don't know what I'm going to say right. or do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that, I th that was the road I was going down. Like, I thought there was a debate uh, upon uh, whether you should actually wake people up or not. I think what I've read is that, yeah, wake them up, it's not going to kill them or something like that. Yes, I haven't found anything that said waking <laughs> them up is harmful. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. Uh, so the thing that I uh, promoted uh, in conjunction with this podcast that will come on in a few minutes uh, when we wrap up here is uh, I have some friends that uh, work in a sleep lab at Notre Dame, and they, like, bring college students into the lab and uh, like have them learn a bunch of stuff before they go to bed and then uh, they sleep in the lab and then that they wake up the next morning and they test them on uh, the stuff that they tried to learn and they found that the people who sleep afterwards remember things better uh, have you seen anything with uh, differences in like sleep quality or um, like sleep things in sleepwalkers um no i haven't seen anything like that all yeah. I was they were saying that um if you're like sleep deprived mm -hmm. it can increase. trigger it increase yeah. the chance of you sleepwalking that night okay all right oh uh, well I think we'll wrap this up because uh, I'm kind of feeling, feeling kind of sleepy myself uh late afternoon uh talking about sleep uh so I think we'll, we'll end it there. Okay. So thanks so much for coming. Thank you for having me. So thanks so much to Mary for coming in and uh, talking about uh, sleepwalking, such an interesting uh, and yeah, hard to understand, uh, or at least uh, needs some more research to understand better uh, area of uh, neuroscience. Uh, turning to the last uh, two segments of the show, uh, I'd like to give a scholar notification or look at scholar notifications uh, here where I look at uh, newer interesting research. I guess I'm going to combine this with uh, Jake's Jams, scholar notifications and Jake's Jams. Jake's Jams being things that I'm interested in and want to share with other people. Scholar notification being uh, kind of research-based, uh, yeah, research-based journal articles or things in research that I've uh, found interesting lately. And uh, since we were talking about sleep, I'd like to uh, give a shout out to two friends uh, that I met at Cognitive Neuroscience Society meeting, I want to say 2014, uh, out in San Francisco, uh, Tony Cunningham and Enma Perdillo uh, from the Notre Dame SAM lab, uh, which is the Notre Dame Sleep and Memory Lab. 
Uh, they work uh, under the direction of uh, Dr. Payne uh, in the, oh, it, let's see, it's Sleep, Stress, and Memory Lab. Sorry, the SAM lab at Notre Dame, Sleep, Stress, and Memory Lab. And uh, I just wanted to give a shout out to them and uh, let you know that they have a number of interesting studies uh, going uh, on right now. One, Sleep for Science, uh, that is the first of three funded by the National Institute of Aging, examining the influence of emotional salience and aging on sleep-based selective memory consolidation, where they're using a dual daytime napping paradigm to investigate how people remember emotional information when they have had an early or a late nap with different sleep stage compositions. Uh, and so they're recruiting from anyone in the northern Indiana community, uh, and they're looking for participants anywhere between the ages of 18 and 65 uh, to examine these age-related changes in sleep, memory, and the interaction between sleep, emotion, and aging. Uh, and so they're also looking at sleep physiology, things like spindles and spectral frequencies, uh, in order to delve deeper into the role of sleep and consolidation. Uh, there's also uh, another study called There's a Nap for That, uh, this study is the second of the, uh, the three funded by the National Institute of Aging, examining the influence of emotional salience on aging on sleep-based selective memory consolidation, and so they're examining how information competes uh, for a place in memory given different salient cues, such as emotional salience or direction to remember or forget the information. So participants will either nap or remain awake during a break. And uh, another study is the adaptive sleep-wake. Uh, in this study, they are investigating adap adaptation effects on memory. Uh, of particular interest is experimental evidence that memory in the con context of survival is more robust than other significant life events, such as moving to a foreign land. Uh, so that study is investigating the roles of valence and arousal on, on these findings. So that's the SAM lab, the Sleep, Stress, and Memory Lab at Notre Dame. Uh, so anyone in the northern Indiana region uh, should look to participate in that research and contribute to some really interesting uh, findings and research. Uh, and so also uh, give a shout out again to uh, Tony Cunningham and Emma Perdillo, two uh, graduate students in the SAM lab at Notre Dame. And so finally turning to the last segment of the show, uh, reader mail or tweeter, Twitter tweets. Uh, nothing so far, uh, but you can reach me with any questions or suggestions at Engage Brain on Twitter or at the Engage Brain Podcast at gmail.com. Definitely looking for any uh, questions or suggestions in order to uh, be able to uh, research new or more interesting things uh, as we run out of the podcast. I think this is the last one that I'm recording, so or second to last one, somewhere in there. Uh, so starting to uh, need new topics to chase down. Uh, otherwise, I'll just have to looked at things that I think are interesting, uh, but would be uh, particularly interested in finding out what other people are interested in. So this has been the Engaged Brain Podcast. Thanks so much for listening.